Welcome back to the show. We got fantastic highlights from a great interview in Japan with Brad Garlinghouse. Let's not waste any time. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and digperspectives.com for exclusive content. Right now, $2.01 trillion market cap for crypto. Market is off by 3.5% right now. $54,400 for Bitcoin, $2,200 plus for Ethereum, $118 plus million, uh, billion dollar market cap for uh, USD Tether, and USDC $34 billion plus. Number seven spot is XRP at $0.52, cents, and it is off by one27 and 24 and it's off by 7.2 in a seven day. Notice Bitcoin off by eight on the seven day. Uh, Ethereum off by 9.4 on the seven day. And uh, then let's see the range of price here between 51 cents on the bottom and 55 cents on the top. So you can actually see we dipped all the way to 51 cents. Now I did a little dip by today and it wasn't much because I got to be careful. But that habit of just building that discipline to, to know when it's down to just it kicks into motion. No matter how small it was, uh, I still exercise that that buying the dip for myself. And it's not financial advice. I'm just sharing the habit and discipline that I've built over the years. I'm very proud of myself for that. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. I want to remind everybody right now, first of all, Ripple on the board. It's going to be gone soon. You know how this works. There's so much on this platform that is absolutely incredible that spans over so many emerging sectors that are just the right place to be right now. Whether we're talking about AI, fintech, digital assets, blockchain, robotics, it's on this platform. And I know a lot of you are like, but I can't invest in it. But the answer today is, yes, you can. They have opportunities for all U.S. investors. And all you need to do is take less than five minutes and sign up and register and fund your account just like that. And it's all investors with the most affordable minimums on the planet when it comes to private equity. Trust me on that one. Click the link below and get started today. Oh, I love it. What a great opportunity that is. Kalshi, a platform offering futures contracts on real world events, has scored a legal win on its ongoing battle with the U.S. Commodities Futures Trade Commission and that blocks its plans to offer election betting contracts. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're going to start betting on the election. Whoa. And they won, but now they haven't gotten the exact details on how they won, on what, what the ruling actually is. They were told that they have a victory, but the judge has not issued the ruling yet. So the CFTC is holding out to find out the details of how the judge came to that ruling, and then we'll see where the case goes from there. But nonetheless, we'll see. But can you imagine the arguments that's going to create? You know what I mean? Well, the, 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 everyone who bet on this... You know what I mean? The, the polls are showing one thing, and what happened was another. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bring it all on. I want to see it all. All right, so here we see uh, Chad Steingrober says, uh, congrats, you bought, and this is in reference to Zero Hedges post, by the way. There was probably over one, I want to say, hold on, I, have, I think I have it lined up here. Over $1.78 trillion was wiped out of the U.S. stock market in the first week of September. Hello, summer's over. Yeah, everybody coming back in off the beach to see that their portfolio has been absolutely wrecked, right? But Chad Steingraber grabs that point, understanding that there's uh, a proposal from Harris, Kamala Harris, to you to uh, tax uh, unrealized gains, 24 or 29 percent, whatever it is. And that means if you make over $100 million and you have some money invested in something and it goes up $10 million or a $1 million or whatever it is, and you don't even cash it out, they're saying you've got to pay that 20 plus percent against those gains and you never cashed it out. I think we all understand how that would wreck the economy, right? Would you leave your money here for that little fancy rule to happen to you? Or would you simply go somewhere else in some other market and take your money elsewhere? I know what the hell I'd do. I can tell you that. That is not family friendly at all right there. 
So here you see it. $1.78 trillion wiped out in the first week of September. You know, I have said this. We've seen these flash crashes. And before that, we've seen what? A good handful of banks collapse. You know, the, the signals are there. I'm not asking for it. I'm not begging for it. I'm not praying for it, cheering for it. I'm just paying attention. I don't decide whether this happens or not. I can see that it's happening. What I'm trying to do the best I can, as well as many people listening, is put my money and investments in places understanding the fragility of what's going on here, right? And, and how sensitive it all is and how quickly it can all come down. I've lived through it before. Most of you have too. So, you know, this is not something we should be unaccustomed to. The question is, is this time... Will they do what we all have been watching, which is usher in the new digital economy and vote, uh, payment protocols, value protocols, to make it all go? And in order to do that, we need legislation. It is quite clear to me that the legislation is the issue here. It's quite clear to me that legislation is the logjam. It's even more clear to me today than it ever has been before that that is the problem. And we're going to get there. And I think they'll use the next crisis because they won't never let a good crisis go to waste. Isn't that the words we know? And let us not forget that when that crisis comes and that transition happens, Ripple are titans. They are members of ISDA, the International Swaps Derivatives Association, working with the DTCC and others to help settle digitally the derivatives market, which will be over $1.2 quadrillion in size. How much of that do they settle? I don't know. But DTCC acquired security, made it digital assets. Ripple joined ISDA. They're all working together so they can solve this together. Now, whether they phase that in at 1% of payment flows or settlement to 5% or 12%, who knows? They're doing it. And you know what? There's no better example of that than what you're about to see here. MUFG, SMBC, Misusu, Mis, or Mizuhao uh, plan to use stable, use stable coin based system to facilitate cross border payments in the future. The initiative project PAX replaces correspondent banks with blockchain technology, linking it to SWIFT. Now, all of that. I believe is going to have a huge collaboration and partnership with Ripple and obviously SBI and XRP and RLUSD, which is soon to come. I believe this was probably going to go down as one of the most informative and remarkable interviews with Brad Garlinghouse. I think the timing is impeccable and they cover so much so quickly. Let's get into this right now. I will have a couple moments that I need to stop and highlight something, but I'm going to do my best to keep it uninterrupted. But there's some fantastic stuff in here we all need to make sure we hear and acknowledge. Let's go right now. And you're coming here with sort of good news, I guess, for people who have been following what you do. You could be launching your stablecoin a bit faster than most people thought. Well, we've always been kind of consistent that we're going to launch, do everything we can to launch this year. Uh, everything Ripple does is in conjunction with regulatory approval, licensing. And so a key issue that we will continue to make sure we are partnered with U.S. regulators before we go live with the stablecoin We'll first issue it, uh, we expect, in the U.S., but we think there's opportunity for stablecoins globally. And certainly Japan, as you, I think, probably know, they approved some legislation a year ago that came into effect this year. And so there's uh, a process underway now to do stablecoins here in Japan as well. Yeah, I want to talk about that. But when we're talking about the U.S., we're talking about a matter of weeks for this launch. Before he answers that question, let's remember 60 plus banks in Japan are already working in a uh, consortium with SBI and Ripple to use XRP. Now, the integration and understanding that Japan already has a taxonomy for crypto and stable coins, this is massive. Keep listening. Yeah, our expectation has been to move as quickly as we can. Uh, we had, you know, some people, I think, thought well, that might be the very end of the year. We won't know for sure until regulators say, yes, we have the green light. Uh, but we're optimistic. We acquired a company uh, called Standard Custody, which had a New York DFS trust license. 
and there's a process you go through to kind of transfer that and how it's going to be used. We've had a great partnership with the New York DFS, Department of Financial Services, through a bit license we've had for many years. Uh, and we'll continue to partner with them and work through that with them before we go live. Tell us a little about the use case. How does this really differentiate from your token itself? Because that's also been talked about the payment system, right? Right. We've always used XRP, uh, the, the digital asset that's kind of native to our technology stack. We've used that as a bridge asset to transfer money across borders. What we have found is that stable coins, particularly US dollar stable coins, has gone from a pretty small market to today it's about $170 billion worldwide. And people think that that may end up being two to three trillion in about five years. Given Ripple's place in the payments infrastructure, as well as a trusted brand partnering with financial institutions and regulators, we felt like there's an opportunity to enter the stablecoin market as that market continues to grow. We already have used stablecoins in our payment flows for certain corridors, depending upon whether you're going to the Australian dollar, the Philippine peso, certain corridors, it's more efficient to use a stablecoin at times. So we always use what's best for the customer, and we decided to go live and build our own stablecoin, and uh, excited to get live with that this year. Thinking of building a stablecoin here in Japan, I mean, you said that the regulations here were clearer, but at the same time, it's a more of a conservative market, no? You know, I think Japan has been a more conservative market in some ways, but I actually think that in some ways is also really healthy. Uh, Japan, more so than some countries around the world, leaned in early to provide regulatory clarity and passed legislation, both about stablecoins, but even further back, I think 2017 or 2018, the FSA here in Japan issued clarity and a kind of a taxonomy, a framework for how different cryptos would be regulated. And that has really allowed, I think, entrepreneurship and investment to thrive here in Japan. Now, as compared to the United States, which has really been behind mm. but certainly Japan and the UK and behind Switzerland, so a lot of countries are leading, and Japan has been in many ways one. That's not to say they haven't been conservative about the regulation, but I think that can be really healthy. As long as there's clear rules of the road, entrepreneurs will work within them. So if you're imagining a stable coin in Japan, what's the time frame? Well, I think right now Ripple in particular is focused on let's get live with the US dollar stable okay. coin. But I think there will be, people will want to hold yen stable coins, and I think that's only a matter of time. And I think the regulators here in Japan, again, about a year ago, passed some legislation around that, and there's some companies going through the licensing process right now to get live. A lot of the companies that are involved in this space in Japan are larger corporations. Is that sort of a concern, not having the smaller, you know, innovative guys take the lead? Well, I think what you're seeing is some of the bigger guys partnering with the smaller mm. innovative companies. Uh, Ripple, way back in 2016, uh, partnered with SBI, one of the largest and most successful banking conglomerates here and you know, really across a lot of financial services here in Japan. And that's been a really successful partnership for us and for them. So uh, we feel like it makes sense for to when you enter some of these markets to partner with some of the bigger guys. And that's true in Korea. That's true in Japan. Uh, depending on what market you go into, we try to figure out what's the best way to enter. Especially here in Japan, we've talked about regulation being a bit more clear, but also the government has been very active in setting those regulations. At the same time, we're headed towards a presidential election for the ruling Liberal Democratic Party. Do you have any views on the potential that this market could change? Well, I, actually, while I've been here in Japan, I've met with regulators, I've met with the FSA, I've met with elected representatives, and it, what I've heard consistently is a desire to lean into these technologies. Uh, I think the, the environment here from a macro point of view has been very pro-innovation and it, this helps create job growth. It helps uh, I mean, even getting the economy kind of jump started and what has been a little bit deflationary, I think some of these assets can actually be used to address that and provide some balance and how pricing acro across different jurisdictions occurs. You're even encouraged as an outsider because some of these markets in Asia can tend to be very insular. Yeah, I think historically that's been my impression. I will tell you, I have felt incredibly warm welcomes across the board you know, with the FSA, with elected representatives. They want to see technologies like this embraced and adopted, whether it's crypto and blockchain or AI. That's a consistent message I heard in all of my meetings over the last day or two. Does that really contrast to what you're feeling in the U.S., the warmth and embrace? <laughs> You know, it's a sad reality. You know, I mean, I, I, I chuckle about it, but it's frustrating. You know, I, I grew up in the United States. Uh, a majority of Ripple's employees are based in the United States today. But 
our, our number of employees we hire outside the United States has grown dramatically I was because to say, how big is that? How big so we have about 900 employees globally. 75% uh -huh. uh, of our hiring has been non-US, in part because of exactly what you're talking about. The US has been pretty hostile towards crypto. Uh, the Biden administration, frankly, has taken a pretty negative view, and that has meant this kind of regulation through enforcement. The United States SEC has sued a lot of companies in the space. And rather than doing the hard work that the Japanese regulators have done of codifying and creating a, a framework, they've just sued people. That's not a really great way to regulate an industry. Do you think th that would change if we have the more overtly crypto-friendly Trump administration coming back in? Well, I don't know who's going to win. I think regardless of who wins, you're going to see new leadership uh, at the United States Security and Exchange Commission. Mm. And that will be, I think, an important uh, a changing of the guard. Now. At, Trump and the Republicans clearly have leaned into being very pro-crypto. I view crypto and blockchain as a very bipartisan. It, you shouldn't care about a technology depending on what party you're from. I think being pro-innovation and pro-job growth makes sense on both sides of the aisle. So it's almost like saying, I'm a Republican, I'm anti-email, but I'm a Democrat, I'm pro-email. Like, that doesn't make sense. At it's least how for you the use time, them. At least for the time being, though, given that there is that lack of uh, clarity, given that, you know, pro and anti-email. <laughs> yeah. No US IPO, uh, at least for now. No, Listen. we don't have any. That's not our horizon. We're frankly very lucky to have a very strong balance sheet. We've made acquisitions. We bought a custody company last year for 250 million US dollars. We've done stock buybacks to our private shareholders. But going public in the United States when the SEC isn't a big fan of uh, crypto and certainly Ripple even specifically, I don't think that's in the cards. So soon. where is all of that money coming from? Like how much of that ratio comes from overseas, especially Asia? I don't know the exact ratio. Uh, I mean, we think about our business as a very global business. 95% uh, of our customers are non-US customers. Mm -hmm. About 40% of our business is in the Asia Pacific region in terms of payment flows. Mm -hmm. And again, our customers, Ripple the company, our customers are banks, financial institutions, payment providers. We build, we use the XRP ledger, we use the token XRP to kind of facilitate these transactions. Some people get confused about which is which, but you know, Ripple, the company, our, com our customers are all these banks and financial institutions. And there you have it. That is a packed, packed little interview and you're right coming there. Here with sort of that's trying to start a second time. First of all, I want to shout out XRP Bags. Give him a follow if you haven't done it. Really cool dude, super informative, and very talented. Make sure you give that guy a follow. Uh, look, all eyes on Japan and SBI. And by the way, the UK as well, right? Because the UK is a huge financial hub for clearing and settlement and payments. This is a global world, ladies and gentlemen. All eyes on Japan and S SBI. We know how many banks, 60 plus are tied in a consortium to work together with Ripple and, and SBI and XRP ultimately at the end goal. That is coming to fruition, and I think the real USD is going to help bring it there even quicker, right? Uh, look, we need to understand in the traditional markets, the bond market especially, Japan is a very closely tied relationship to the United States of America between their economy, their, do their yen, and our dollars and bonds. So keep it all eyes on that. That is a pretty fantastic interview. Shout out to the woman who interviewed him and Brad Garlinghouse for all the clear answers there that he could give. Look, time is everything, ladies and gentlemen. Speaking of time, and we're going into the freedom zone and you're going to want to join us today, boy. You talk about censorship. We're getting ready to see it. it you know, I can't believe that this is how we have to talk about certain subjects. It makes me want to get sick. It makes me want to physically get sick. It is a clear recognition that we don't have free speech, that we have to go into the freedom zone. But how else are we supposed to do it? Digperspectives.com. Click the freedom zone. Come on in. Oh, Google ads every day, none, zero. That's right. Daily videos posted with zero Google ads if you want the Freedom Zone for next to nothing and extra content that deals with censorship and other issues outside of crypto, which is really great. We're having wonderful conversations in there. And you can also join the DPMG, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you something. Look, I know your time is busy. I know that your schedules are crazy. I know you can't keep up with everything. And the markets, in fact, are collapsing. We just saw evidence of it. But you can get the tools you need, investor checklists, portfolio creation, groups and courses, support from a, we, a community that is absolutely remarkable. They are a mastermind. 
private weekly live stream. And yes, you get the Freedom Zone for free if you join the DPMG. Currently, right now, you can learn how to use XRP Ledger Automated Market Makers. Currently, right now, we're going through a case study watching me get a trust, learning how to protect our assets and protect our wealth and maintain it going into the future. We can't just grow our portfolio. We have to grow our minds with our portfolio. You can't have a million dollar portfolio without a million dollar mind or you're gonna go broke again. That's a very real thing. And that's what we're working on inside of here. Click the link below, join us all inside before the window closes. I do not like to let this group get but so big. So if you want in, come on in and let's get this done. Now let's get into the Freedom Zone, not financial advice from me or anyone else. Here we go.